Welcome to St. Michael's Uniting Church online gathering. I'm Margaret Mayman, Minister at St. Michael's. Wherever you've come from, wherever you're going to, whatever you believe, whatever you do not believe, you are welcome. Today we celebrate the 43rd anniversary of the Uniting Church in Australia. A church born of vision, conviction, hard work, struggle, hopefulness and grace. This morning, as we mark that anniversary, we remember that all our church buildings, halls, schools, and monuments stand on ancient ground that was and is sacred to the first peoples of this land. The Spirit of God has long dwelled with the people of this ancient land. And this morning, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and other first peoples on whose land we stand the first inhabitants of this place from time beyond remembering. We honour their custodianship of the land and with them we pray for justice for Indigenous people and for the land. Next week, unless there is a major uptick in community transmission of COVID-19 in Victoria, it will likely be possible for congregations of up to 50 people to gather if their building is large enough to allow four square metres per person. We're investigating the square meterage of St Michael's, but we know we will need to allow for many more than 50 people, so we will be continuing with online church. I'm very grateful that we have been able to do this and deeply appreciative of the energy and gifts of everyone who is involved. When we are allowed to gather together face to face, we won't be reopening the church because the church didn't ever close. You and I are the church, together and apart. We do look forward to reopening the church building and we look forward to being together. And we give thanks for now that we are able to continue together in this way, to reflect on our lives, our community and our world on our sacred texts, and to be open to the sacred source of life and love, the sacred that holds us all, in the words of St Paul, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Our church life continues in other ways too. There are still meetings. We meet as the church council, as committees and deaneries. We focus on projects. We have been attending to the material matters related to the life of the church. For example, commissioning a conservation management plan for the Heritage Church building. The Church Council also attends to our finances. And we realise that one thing that we haven't included in our online services is an acknowledgement and dedication of our offerings. While we are not able to meet face to face and while our buildings cannot be used by other groups, it is a reality that our income is reduced. We recognise that this is a time of uncertainty for many people financially, but we felt that it was important to acknowledge the gifts that have been received via donations on our website or being sent to the church office. So in today's service and from henceforth, we will include a prayer of dedication. The Church Council is obviously grateful but in worship, we also recall that the act of giving generously and responsibly, recognising everyone's unique individual circumstances, that this is part of discipleship and that the gifts are given not just to keep the ship afloat, but to resource our mission as faithful people seeking the common good. So let us gather together wherever we are. You need not bring anything here success or excuses, just yourself and this week's living, and dedicate it to the one who risks everything on the future and calls it resurrection. Let us sing together a traditional hymn of praise when morning gilds the skies.
light three candles to mark the anniversary of the Uniting Church, symbolizing the three denominations that came into union and marking three periods of time, our past, our present, and our future. The first candle marks the beginning of our church. We remember and honor all who worked hard, reflected honestly, consulted again and again, compromised and did so with grace, and prayed earnestly to bring about a new creation in Christ. We remember and honor their courage and their hopefulness. We light the second candle in acknowledgement of all who over the decades since have sought to stay true to the vision of the founders of the Uniting Church, while reminding us that change, risk and uncertainty are in our DNA, that we are a pilgrim people, ever on the move, called always to be responsive to the unsettling, grace-filled, loving spirit that moves through us all. The third candle marks our conviction that the future that awaits us is already with us, that we are shaping that future in all we do right now, that however limited our efforts are at times, we are making our church anew and seeking to do so with faith and hope and courage. In the Uniting Church, may we become the people we were called to be, recognising the connectedness of all things, overcoming the pain of division and exclusion, healing the hurts of colonialism and abuse, and recalling the love of the Spirit for each of us and for all creation. Let us take a moment now to settle into the silence. Hear and feel your quiet breathing. Let us pray. Divine Presence, accompanying your people in all generations, in all the power, mystery and design of this world, draw us near, inspire us to see anew the life before us, from the source of our being, we yearn for new vision, new eyes to see the world, new ears to hear the cries of sorrow and joy. We open ourselves to the pain we guard within ourselves and to the pain known by all who are hungry in body or in spirit. And we hold a silence for our own thoughts and prayers. Remembering Jesus who taught his friends to pray, let us join in the ecumenical version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Each week we take a time to greet those around us, whether at church or at home, uh, and we extend an offering of peace. I invite you in response to my words of peace to you,
to offer peace to others in your household if you're meeting with others, or beyond that to your community and to the wider world. May the peace of divine presence be with you. Amen. The contemporary reading consists of two excerpts from the founding document of the Uniting Church, The Basis of Union. The Way into Union. The Congregational Union of Australia, the Methodist Church of Australasia, and the Presbyterian Church of Australia, in fellowship with the whole Church Catholic and seeking to bear witness to that unity, which is both Christ's gift and will for the Church, hereby enter into union under the name of the Uniting Church in Australia. They pray that this act may be to the glory of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They give praise for God's gifts of grace to each of them in years past. They acknowledge that none of them has responded to God's love with a full obedience. They look for a continuing renewal in which God will use their common worship, witness, and service. Builds upon the one Lord, Jesus Christ. The Church, as the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, confesses Jesus as Lord over its own life. It also confesses that Jesus is head over all things. The beginning of a new creation, of a new humanity. God in Christ has given to all people in the Church the Holy Spirit, as a pledge and foretaste of that coming reconciliation and renewal, which is, in the end, in view for the whole creation. The Church's call is to serve that end, to be a fellowship of reconciliation, a body within which the diverse gifts of its members are used for the building up of the whole, an instrument through which Christ may work and bear witness to himself. The Church lives between the time of Christ's death and resurrection and the final consummation of all things which Christ will bring. The Church is a pilgrim people, always on the way towards a promised goal. Here the Church does not have a continuing city, but seeks one to come. For the Spirit still speaking through a changing Church, we give thanks.
few words of faith in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 20 to 26. Jesus said, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Abba God, are in me, and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one, as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and I have loved them even as you have loved me. Abba, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous one, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. For the vision of unity of the sacred with humanity, we give thanks. In the name of the Spirit, calling us, challenging us, changing us. Tomorrow, the Uniting Church in Australia will be 43 years old. Ours is one of the youngest mainstream denominations in the Western world. And I acknowledge that many of you have been part of the Uniting Church for far longer than I have. When I first began my ministry in the Uniting Church in 2013, I was still a minister of the Presbyterian Church of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Under Uniting Church regulations, I was only permitted to lead a congregation for three years unless I became a minister of the UCA. So Claire and I had already decided that we were in this for the long haul, and so we entered the process of admission to the Uniting Church ministry. There were certain requirements. We undertook a course of study at United Theological College that included Uniting Church studies and cross-cultural ministries in Australia. With the Pitt Street Congregation, we did the two-day Living Our Values course. While the study added to an already full load of adjusting to a new congregation and a new country, I'm grateful that the Uniting Church insists on these requirements for ministers from other denominations. In Uniting Church studies, I learned about the long journey to union that began in the 1920s, derailed by the Second World War, and revived again during the heights of the post-war ecumenical movement in the 1960s. That ecumenical impulse was sparked by the gospel reading that we heard from John's gospel. Jesus' prayer that those who follow his way, the way of life, lived in divine presence, that we might be one. And that through this unity, the world might know that God loved the world as Jesus knew himself to be loved. Studying the basis of union, the founding document of the Uniting Church, was a key task in Uniting Church Studies. Claire and I jokingly referred to it as the reprogramming uh, course of study. It seemed to us that to be a Uniting Church minister, you had to love the basis of union almost as much as you loved Jesus. But humour aside, it is an incredibly impressive document. It was written in the language of mainstream theology from the mid-20th century, but there were gifts to the new church in the basis that should not be overlooked and which are profoundly significant for our life as a progressive church today. From my experience in the Presbyterian Church in New Zealand, its move towards fundamentalism and an associated hostility toward gay and lesbian people, I was profoundly moved to read of the Uniting Church's foundational commitment to scholarly interpretation of scripture and to engagement with other forms of knowledge available to the human community. Rather than claiming, as many conservative Christians do, that the Bible is the word of God, the basis claims that the Bible enables us to hear the prophetic word of God, which nourishes our faith. 
The basis makes it possible to live with integrity in the church in the 21st century. It talks of an informed faith that draws on the work of scholarly interpreters of scripture. It embraces literary, historical, and scientific inquiry. As a newcomer, exhausted by religious homophobia and biblical literalism, I found these commitments to be glorious and life-giving. In the Uniting Church, I joined a denomination where people are free to question, to explore, to change. As part of its 1977 inauguration, which took place at the Sydney Town Hall, the Uniting Church re released a document titled, A Statement to the Nation. After acknowledging the path to union, it goes on, we affirm our eagerness to uphold basic Christian values and principles, such as the importance of every human being, the need for integrity in public life, the proclamation of truth and justice, the rights of each citizen to participate in decision-making, religious liberty, personal dignity, and a concern for the welfare of the whole human race. It goes on, we pledge ourselves to seek the correction of injustices wherever they occur. We will work for the eradication of poverty and racism within our society and beyond. We affirm the rights of all people to equal educational opportunities, adequate health care, freedom of speech, employment, or dignity in unemployment if work is not available. We will oppose all forms of discrimination which infringe basic rights and freedoms. We will challenge values which emphasize acquisitiveness and greed in disregard of the needs of others and which encourage a higher standard of living for the privileged in the face of the daily widening gap between rich and poor. We are concerned with the basic human rights of future generations and will urge the wise use of energy, the protection of the environment, and the replenishment of the Earth's resources for their use and enjoyment. And further it says, we pledge ourselves to hope and work for a nation whose goals are not guided by self-interest alone, but by concern for the welfare of all persons everywhere, the family of the one God, the God made known in Jesus of Nazareth, the one who gave his life for others. The statement to the nation did make me love the Uniting Church, made me love it even more than I was growing to love it, because there at its inception was a strong, powerful commitment to justice and to being alive and active in the public life of the nation. So often the involvement of the church in public life consists of seeking to impose narrow and exclusionary beliefs on a secular society, a form of engagement that has increased with the rise of Christian fundamentalism in the US and worldwide. In Australia, it was most egregiously obvious in the church opposition to civil marriage equality. Religious freedom means that churches can and should hold their own theological views on what marriage is, but there was absolutely no need for churches to fund and advocate for imposing one religious view of marriage on a society that was increasingly embracing an inclusive understanding that recognized and protected the relationships of its LGBT citizens. The No campaign, along with the revelations about clerical sexual abuse of children, was enormously damaging to the church and to the proclamation of the love of proclamation of love and justice in Australian society. The hurt and distrust which many Australians now have for the church is a very significant aspect of the cultural context in which we are church today. The Uniting Church, through the statement to the nation and the living out of that statement in the work of Uniting Justice and in the engagement of local congregations and service at their communities, has been an alternative religious voice in the public square in Australia. The Uniting Church is not perfect in this area, 
a prime example being our church's abdication of advocacy for its LGBT members during the campaign for civil marriage equality. But at least it did not join the chorus of opposition. And when the assembly finally made the decision that allowed LGBT people to marry in the United Church at the 2018 assembly, that was indeed a powerful statement to the nation about our values of equality and justice and about how we read and understand scripture. The work of doing justice continues today in advocacy for just and humane treatment of asylum seekers, in addressing economic equality, in resisting racism, in a commitment to redress the wrongs of colonialism that continue to devastate the lives of Indigenous, Indigenous Australians today. In 2009, the Uniting Church adopted a new prologue to its constitution, recognising a covenant relationship between the First Peoples, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and all of us who have come later, the Second Peoples. Politically, it recognised the lie of terra nullius, and theologically, it claimed that God was not brought to Australia by the colonisers or the missionaries, but in the words that we sometimes use in our acknowledgement of country, the spirit of God has long dwelled in this ancient land. The ongoing commitment to covenant is lived out in the relationship between the, the Uniting Church and the United Aboriginal and Islander Christian Congress, UAICC. It is a covenant that we have often failed to honour. But echoing St Paul's words to the church in Corinth, it reminds us that as Christians, we are called to be agents of reconciliation. The requirement to study cross-cultural ministries in Australia helped me understand the forces that shaped 21st century Australia and the UCA's very intentional commitment to be a multicultural church. I particularly remember watching a documentary titled Immigration Nation. As a child growing up in New Zealand, I had heard of the White Australia policy, but that documentary gave me an appreciation of the diversity, the rich diversity of migration to Australia, and also of the race-based ideology that shaped it through the period from Federation to the present. Actually, I didn't know much at all about Federation um, at that, when I, before I saw that um, documentary, apart from learning in schools that the railway gauges in different states were not the same. And I had no idea that in 21st century Australia, it would be possible for states to close their borders to one another. Facing the Melbourne winter after living in Sydney, I'd thought that we could count on a midwinter holiday in Queensland, just as we did when we lived in Wellington in New Zealand. But back to Uniting Church Studies. The Uniting Church made a commitment to be a multicultural church at the 1985 Assembly. The statement is the foundation of the honouring of different languages and cultures in the life of the Uniting Church. It is also a grounding for our resistance to racism, whether personal or structural, in our common life and in the wider society. During COVID-19, the Uniting Church continues to speak for justice. The Assembly recently re released a document titled, Build Back Better, a just recovery post COVID-19. And I want to read part of the opening statement by our president, Deidre Palmer. In the space of just a few months, the COVID-19 crisis highlighted the stark inequality and disparity in our Australian society and exacerbated the disadvantage faced by our most vulnerable people. As Australia looks to a post COVID-19 world, we have a unique opportunity to renew our vision, to reimagine policy, and to find creative ways to rebuild a nation that is just for everyone. One of the key learnings in this time of crisis is how deeply connected we are to one another, how deeply we depend on each other. What we have seen clearly is that we are only as strong and healthy as the most vulnerable members of our society. Deirdre wrote, we commend our federal and state governments for their collaborative leadership. We have seen that when everyone works together, 
considering the well-being of others, we are a more compassionate and just society. This statement is based on our belief that each person is created in the image of God and deeply loved by God. That as Christians, we see in the life and mission of Jesus God's call to abundant life for all people and the renewal of the whole creation. So while I don't love the Uniting Church quite as much as I love Jesus, I do love the basis of union and the statements of the church. I love the commitment of our church to keep faith alive and meaningful in 21st century Australia, a nation of migrant peoples of many faiths and expressions of spirituality, dwelling here with the first peoples, descendants of ancient nations, custodians of the land and of the oldest living spiritual traditions on earth. At St Michael's, we build on the public engagement of the Uniting Church, expressing a progressive theological perspective and working towards the common good. And in our community, we are charged with creating an incubator of compassion and justice. While we do not all share the same beliefs, theological or political, we can practice here in community a commitment to compassion and care. We can engage in conversations across difference that model what we hope for in society. The ecumenical impulse that led to the formation of the Uniting Church came from a belief that we human creatures are best when we are one, when we recognize our dependence on one another, that the spirit that moves among us is calling us to recognize that it is connection that matters. I give thanks for the Uniting Church that has made a space for me as a migrant of both faith and nation. And I give thanks for the community of St. Michael, my new home within the Uniting Church, filled with bright possibilities and beautiful people who will make a future following the path of Jesus, loving the world God loves. Amen. The prayers of the people. Let us pray in thanksgiving and solidarity. We are grateful for the companionship of hearts and minds lived out among the pilgrim people of the Uniting Church. We give thanks for St Michael's and for all who have worked with love to sustain the Church in mission over their generations. We are grateful for the gift of life, mindful that to respect life means both to celebrate what life is and to be committed to what life can become. We give thanks to those who serve in leadership in the Uniting Church, and on this anniversary day, we pray for our President, Deirdre Palmer, Assembly General Secretary Colin Geyer, and the Assembly staff. In the Synod of Victoria and Tasmania, we pray for our moderator, Denise Leish, and General Secretary Mark Lawrence, and the Synod staff. We remember who we are called to be in the Church as followers of Jesus, who dared to live in harmony with the sacred, loving boldly, resisting non-violently in the face of abusive power, calling his disciples to live passionate, justice-seeking, spirit-centred lives. We are called to proclaim our faith by the way we live and treat one another. We are called to live hopefully, compassionately and generously. We pray for all in need of comfort and healing and all in need of justice in our community, our city and our world. We pray for people struggling for economic survival, whose lives are all the more precarious because of the pandemic. In our gratitude that the pandemic has been controlled here, let us not turn away from places in the world where it continues to escalate, especially in developing countries that lack health care infrastructure. We pray for people facing multiple challenges in addition to COVID-19. War, violence, racism, natural disasters, hopelessness and abuse. We pray for all who grieve, conscious of people in our community who have lost a beloved partner, parent or friend this week. 
For all for whom death is drawing near, depression confounds or dementia confuses, we pray. We pray for all the times and places where peace, whether physical or emotional or relational, seems yet an impossible dream. We pray for the earth, threatened because of human greed, ignorance and lack of care. In all our concerns, may we hold to our faith that healing is possible and hope can be restored, that justice can be achieved and life be born. May the prayers we share move us to wise choices and courageous actions. In your many names we pray. Amen. In acknowledgement of offerings received, let us pray. Good Spirit, inspiring us always toward the common good, we pray that the gifts of time, money and energy that have been given by members of our community for the sake of your mission will be used to share love, to restore hope and to bring justice. We offer our gifts and we recommit our lives to this purpose. Amen. And in that spirit of generous giving, we sing together, every day I will offer you, loving God, my heart and mind. blessing until we meet again. Go in peace. May you carry Sophia's wisdom, speak forth Christ's truth, and embody divine presence wherever you are. And may the blessing of the Holy One, creator, liberator, and sustainer, be with us and with all creation this day and forevermore. Amen.